started the recording and I'm thinking some of this is actually a really good conversation. Um, I have just kicked off the recording. Uh, thanks, Gail, for reminding me. Do we want to, uh, is it worth repeating that that question, reprompting the question? I mean, I think obviously getting one of the PMs, getting the PMs on uh, in a future session would would be the best answer for, for that. But yeah, the it would be really great to get a vision of where do we go if you've been using Azure, D Azure Automation DSC, you've got an LCM, when do you plan to move? What does that look like? What is the, you know, what is the, how do you do all the conversion that you need to do? Where are the gaps that you need to worry about? I think that that might be a really good topic for a future session. Um, and yeah, Mikey, your your insights is fantastic, but obviously you only get the docs, <laughs> so you don't have the, have the, the, forward look um, that, that the PMs might. So maybe Gail, that could be something we could put to Jody and and who's, who, is it Otumba? Is it looking at Mutumwa. Mutumwa, that's right, yeah. Um, getting them on. Does Michael still have anything to do with all the? He's sitting too he's, high now. He's he's too high, he's too, he's too high above it all. He's too high, um, yes. And does Steve Lee also have a have a sort of a view or, or a guiding, does he guide uh those or is it pretty much just produces the dsc3 v3 tech and leave it to the Maybe azure tell teams me if i'm to, wrong to but I, I would i would call steve working on the platform and then for the solution i would say the config team which is which is mutem wise the pm and jody mm -hmm. is still part of that but she's slightly ia if i remember what mutem told me and then michael is also above and a bit different as well some of them but yes mutem would be the one to to get on the call yep yes yeah is, and is anyone from, oh sorry mikey go on. i was just gonna say from the from the perspective of like steve's involvement we're deep partners with the machine config folks but our focus is on making sure that the engine um and the command line application dsc uh, are rock solid and work for a variety of integrators. Um, what we don't want is to ship something that can't be integrated with Chef, Puppet, Ansible, et cetera, or built on uh, by mm -hmm. people at home. Um, so while we're making sure that all the other partners can make stuff work, I've been keeping a close eye on schemas and design decisions to make sure that it doesn't um, it, it doesn't go you've so far in a bit, direction that cuts everybody else out. You've done a bit more. You've done yeah. a bit more than just keeping an eye on. <laughs> yeah. We can see the commits, you know, yeah. Mikey, we can see the commits <laughs> and the issues. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's another that's thing that I would say about, about V3 is if you have opinions about things that have hurt you in the past for DSC, limitations that bothered you or you found frustrating, stuff you want to see addressed in V3, the sooner you file issues with clear, concrete use cases um, and impacts, the more likely it is that those things get addressed in design earlier. We're in pre-release now. Um, so some of that time is rapidly closing. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been trying to get the team to do is to draw a circle around um, things that have to be done before we can release the first iteration and things that can be extensible later, right? And how painful that'll be. Like, what are the, what are the responsibilities and, and functionalities of DSC? And what are things that we can and should hand off to higher order tools or integrators or people who are wrapping it? Because um, you can't build a tool that serves every use case perfectly. That's just not how tool making works. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is make sure that it's flexible, extensible, but also really, really good at its core job, which is to define state uh, in a way that humans can read. It might not be a pleasure to author, um, but it should be readable uh, and then make sure that we can uh, design resources that will work within that ecosystem identically. Um, so there's been a lot of focus around what the API surface of DSC should be and where you should be able to inject things um, and where DSC will kind of hit you with a rolled up newspaper and say, no, if you want that, you need to do some pre-processing or post-processing, but that's your problem. And I'll be right back, but my dog started dancing on the floor, so I assume she wants to go out. <laughs> I need, uh, I I need to get Mikey to... to replay. Oh, sorry, go, go on, mate. No, go ahead, go ahead. 
replay because i need to get mikey to re- replay his um his his guidance on yeah mikey care to replay what you were saying before about the um about your guidance on azure automation dsc the move towards uh machine configuration what the sort of thinking would be there just what you were saying before just so i can i'm going to share this with with the organizations i've been working with just to just to give them yeah. some insight that they should think about Azure Automation DSC as not getting the level, not getting the long term investment, and that machine config is where things are really going to be going the, forward. The different, the different use case, as you said, if you're just starting, if you've done something before. So yeah, Mikey, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that um, machine config has been deeply partnered with V3. So if you're looking for Lots and lots of new features and improvements and uh, enhanced security modeling and um, visibility and all that kind of stuff. All that stuff is being invested in <laughs> over on the machine config side. Um, so that's where I would look to uh, move my investments if I was still in operations. Um, if I'm planning a migration, that's where I would plan to migrate to. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Mikey. I forgot what we were talking just before that, and I had something to say to Mikey, and it just slipped my mind. <coughs> Thank you, Daniel. No, just kidding. Um, sorry, sorry, Gail. I, I could I could make it slip slip your mind. I've got another question as well that I'd like an opinion on. I recall many years ago we had a discussion generally in the community. Composite configs were bad. We still pretty we 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 yeah. I think the um, expression is generally. We don't like conf- composite configs, right? No. Partial no, configs. Was it? Partial configs. Partial configs. Sorry, partial configs. My bad. Yeah. It's not that they're bad. That's the thinking. It's well, their it's, chel- they're their, bad. Be- yeah. They're bad in one way. So let me put it that way, and then people can add on it. They're yep. bad in the way that uh, they don't set people for success because they will mm. create um, runtime merging potential issues that should be avoided. Collaboration should happen before it, not on the LCM, not on the runtime level. So that's why partial is not that great when you try to collaborate about, because usually people say, well, we want to do a partial because uh, this team is going to do a partial about those stuff and this other team is going to do a partial about Mm. this other stuff. Uh, This is bad and partial is not an answer to that. Nice. That's the way yeah, I, I was trying to dig to out the conversation. I couldn't. It's been so long, I couldn't remember where we'd all discussed, and I was fairly sure we'd said we'd all sort of talked about it and said these are the challenges. This is kind of where we don't want to. We think you, you run into challenges with partial configs. So thanks, Gail. Now I've got that. I can go and have that conversation again. Yeah, but it's not just about the partial. It's not partial or the technical mm, solution. Yeah, behind it's it. the organization. The, the, yeah. It's usually the wrong the, the solution the wrong solution to the wrong to the to the right problem yeah. but the right problem mm-hmm. you know it's not you should not implement a technical solution to a human problem which mm-hmm. yes yeah I'm, it's oh, like so we've been saying that for so many years a phrase we've all been screaming the top exactly. of our lungs for as long as we've been doing config management but, and and um so related and to partial configs it. and composite um the last pre-release of v3 includes uh an include um resource Um, and so what that does is it it resolves another configuration document Um, so this this is more around the way that i would use this is to make it easier for people to read and reason about um uh configurations right Um, and the important thing is uh and and what i've been pushing the team to add is a um a resolution command so that i could have a top level config that has a couple of includes, which themselves may or may not include includes. Um, What I want is give me that full node graph. Let me Mm. see what the fully exploded uh, set of uh, resources is. And then I may want to check that in as the canonical config of this application for this deployment or whatever, Um, because you want that to be reliable, repeatable, and introspectable. Um, and uh, to Gail's point, it's not 
a way around having to care about the security concerns. Like you can't, you can't just be like, oh, well, that team handles the security settings. I handle the app settings um, because that never works in practice. Anybody who's ever tried it has been like, oh, we ended up in conflict. Um, and uh, it's a thing that I think comes up a lot with people is they, they want to have to know less about the systems they're configuring and that just never works in practice. Um, you actually need to be able to get a good view of the, the system you're configuring and define what you want. And it's okay to not know why a setting is that way, but that it has to be that way today. That just means that you have to go and investigate and figure it out, right? Um, and our systems are constantly updating and changing. Um, and I think this can be a way to make it easier to manage and track changes instead of looking at a 16,000 line file that represents mm -hmm. system state. You can look at, oh, I just want to see you know, what are the, the users and groups that are defined on this system? So I can go check that file. And I you can reduce your cognitive load when you're working with it, but the end result is still a single declarative state file. But am I right thinking that there's no checks made on these configuration documents? So that means you put in there what you want to put in there, and then you tooling should do the checks that the compilation process was doing, such as uh, checking you don't have twice the same keys setting different values <clears throat> on um, resources. Yes, currently. So that's one of the, the pieces of the schema that's um, still being talked about and worked through is um, a way to identify uh, conflicting resource uh, definitions, right? Um, so in Puppet, they had uh, the functionality of like a name var. In PowerShell, we had those um, properties marked as keys. Um, we need something similar for V3. It's not implemented yet um, because that is a, a real problem. Conflicts in the node graph will cause continuous pain for you. Flip, flip. So DSC3 V3 doesn't have uh, doesn't have the concept of keys. Not implemented. So it's a uh, uh, so we've been talking about it um, and we've been trying to decide on a, an implementation um, for it um, because in V3 resource instances, uh, their data model is represented by a, a JSON schema, right? And there's nothing in default JSON schema that says um, this this instance would be in conflict with that instance, right? There's, there's no property by property uniqueness uh, piece in the default uh, widely used vocabulary. So we would need to extend it or we would need to come up with uh, something at the manifest level um, one level up from that, that that does the same identification. But either way, you need to users need to know what's a, what are key properties and what aren't, um, and the system needs to be able to introspect on instances of those properties in a configuration to determine whether or not you have a conflict. Gail. Yes, I wanted to add something. I split my mind. It's so hard to be tired. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, no, you said there's no concept of keys, and I just wanted to remind there's no concept of keys on the configuration document, but the resources are the resources, right? So that doesn't yes. mean this is going away. It's yeah, just in the configuration document. <clears throat> yeah, that's what more what I was I was getting at. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, we could validate, you know, you could have the JSON document defining everything, and there would still be a way to validate that that was... Uh, correct, even though it was not, you know, uh, you weren't doing any violation of the JSON schema itself. But the resource, you could determine that a resource was going to end up with a, you know, uh, a machine that had a conflict. Yep. Um, the yep. the problem is less around how do we get PowerShell resources to tell us what their keys are, and more mm -hmm. what's the model for that for uh, all the other integrations. So you can think about what you would want in a VS Code extension, right, is if I start adding an instance to my configuration, and that instance, I start typing in values that are uh, that, that would raise a conflict with an existing instance, mm -hmm. I want to be warned about that then. I don't want to find out when yeah. I applied my configuration. I want to find out during the authoring and edi editing experience. Totally. Um, yeah. But similarly, that information has to be available. Um, we, we have to have a model that explicates that stuff in the the resource definition, the the, the data definition, the manifest um, for a resource, because any higher order tooling, right? If there's a, a Puppet integration or for machine config, how do they know except by running DSC config validate, right? 
that's not the time that they want to find out either. Um, as they're building any of their tools on top, they want to be able to provide that same information to their users and and um, fail earlier and clearly. Because um, it's a it's a it's a problem that you can resolve or you can discover statically, right? Um, for the most part. Now, where that gets complicated is if you're passing in parameters and variable values and interpolating uh, from data down into your resource instances, then you need to do um, a resolution step before you can check the node graph to make sure you have no conflicts. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. I feel like Gail's going to recall his question in a, in a second. Gail's muted. Yeah, I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> really hard today, as you can tell. Um, yeah, so I was asking, you have um, you have a DSCB3 as a validation, a validation um, tool, which is only doing schema validation of the configuration document. Or do you have not the validation part? Uh, so when you say validation, you mean checking Just whether a, a document, the configuration document is valid? Yes. Yes. So right now, um, there are, there's a, a validation step that runs uh, ahead of time. There's some stuff that has to be deferred um, because of configuration functions, because of interpolation. Um, but prior to uh, executing any of the um, uh, resource invocations, we check the uh, data against the defined schema. Um, so if after all the interpolations and everything, you call the register resource and you goofed up something there, um, you'll find that out before it tries to set a registry key. Um, currently, I would always, well, I've always advised everybody for forever is if you're writing a new, if you're writing or changing a configuration document, you need to run that in what if or test mode first. Do not just change system state without checking what it thinks it should do. Um, no matter how confident you are in the tools, you always want to have that uh, check first because tool implementers can be wrong. Uh, and I have been several times uh, when I was a, a resource author. Um, I always think about the time where I fixed a bug in the Puppet SQL Server um, resource that uh, was supposed to stop intermittent uh, uninstall, reinstall. Now, technically, I did fix it because instead of intermittently uninstalling and reinstalling, it would do it on every run, which is a different bug, <laughs> but you know, uh, not the desired <laughs> outcome. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I would say always run in tester or yeah. what if mode. Yeah. Are you the tool that allows you to just do that on uh, something that doesn't matter? Yes. Like test test kitchen or whatever. Yeah, you should have in a in a mature deployment um, model. I would recommend that people have some sort of automated uh, test framework before they get to apply to production. It's not perfect. It'll never be perfect, but you still want that. Talk to Raymond about this. Uh, Andrew, um, Andrew, thank you for joining. I was about to ask you, you know, I've, I've seen you connected and I thought maybe you've got something to share. And then you said you, you, you've been working on what? Can you just unmute and then say hi? Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I was, um, um, I, I recall that this was not probably shown yet. Um, so far, it's it's kind of a side effort, but still uh, may be useful to um, some people in the community. So, um, um, if we have time now, uh, Gail, uh, I can quickly do this mini demo. Yes, um, please. So, okay. so Steve talked about it, but Steve said at some point, maybe later, we will have some things. So now, now's your show time. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's still uh, in uh, work in progress, and uh, but you know, people can play with it uh, already and uh, provide feedback whether this is going in the right direction or not. 
So basically, we're, we're going to talk about um, uh, tab completion when authoring uh, configuration documents for DSC v3 and specifically tab completion for classic uh, PowerShell class based resor DSC resources. Um, uh, so there is a PR on the in the DSC repo. There is this PR called VS Code uh, DSC v3 completion provider, and it's uh, basically you know still an active PR with with like a demo uh, on it. So this is where you can leave uh, and welcome to leave the feedback uh, about it or make suggestions um, um, how to make things better. Um, when it installs as a, a VS Code extension, uh, the Redmi has like uh, steps to build it and to install it, and yeah. And the essence of it is when you authoring once that VS Code extension is running, when you authoring a DSC v3 configurations which are YAML files, uh, tab completion currently um, implemented for um after you specify the type field right so um, you put in a semicolon and there you have a list of all available um dscv2 class-based resources on the machine and for each one there are two options one is uh, whether it will type complete all existing fields of the resource or it will type complete only keys so for this particular case for sql audit resource if we tap complete it there you go uh, it it um fills in all the properties of the resource so you can you know write whatever you need in here so you don't need to cross reference the resource schema for for this author and work this way um again if we uh do it for for uh is only uh among the properties list will be only the uh, DSC class properties must marked with keys attributes. Um, so yeah, that's the essence of it. Um, and uh, again, currently, this is in the form of PR that will go into the DSC repo as a code, um, and you can see it on the pull requests. Um, um, so yeah, feel free to try it out and uh, provide your suggestions about it. That's it. <laughs> So we need we need to lobby Steve to accept awesome. it, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Steve, merge this PR now. <laughs> but we should try it out first, to be uh, to be honest. Um, I have a question. You said um, it discovers every every class based resource available on the machine. Is it just the PS module path, and then we have to change the PS module path for that? Yeah. So basically. Uh, uh... How, how this entire work happened is that for, for DSCV3, we um, implemented uh, a performance optimizations of um, uh, specifically for the, for the class based resources, right? So, what we implemented uh, is uh, like basically a cache, uh, local cache of, of the all discovered uh, class based resources on the machine. Yes, they are essentially tied to the ps module path um, and um, that performance optimization is basically saving all the class all the resource class based resource declarations into a file which makes it very easy for other utilities like this vs code extension to read that file and extract the class definitions resource definitions from it um, so yeah. So let, let's say if we realize we're missing one resource and then we want to add this resource, what's the workflow and how does it update the cache? Um, good question. So the the um, it all comes down. You, you have to run a DSC resource list command or at least once. And again, this is DSC v3 um, executable. Well, I, I don't have it built. You don't have it there. This but yeah. 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 But essentially. But that, so this, this command will will create a local cache and VS code extension will pick it up automatically. OK, so every time we do any, uh, we download a new resource, we install a new resource, whatever we want to say, or we copy a new resource, then we have to just run DSC exit list. Exit list. That's going to rebuild the cache 
and then it will be available in VS Code extension. Again, in this very like pre-alpha version of the of a currently active PR, yes, but obviously, you know, if if we want to uh, kind of polish this, obviously, we'll need to integrate the refresh mechanism into the VS Code extension. Yes. Yeah, but and, feel, now we know. and again and again, feel free to make suggestions in the PR um, how yeah. to, you know, what, what's the easiest workflow would look like. At least if we yeah. know the best one is the one we know about first of all. So if there's a workaround, that's good. <laughs> but uh, but okay, so then we can find it, and then it's tied to whatever the DSC exe resource list finds. So that's yeah, that also makes it pretty easy to to understand and see what the documentation is. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. So that's a that's a better experience to um, to author uh, DSC configuration documents. That's cool. Uh, and so, if you're doing so that, Steve wasn't lying. If you're if you're authoring configuration documents now, um, and you're using non PowerShell resources, if you turn on the um, uh, if you associate your file with the YAML uh, schema. Uh, definition, the JSON schema definition, then you'll get hover and help and autocomplete and all those kinds of things as well. Um, so what we're kind of hoping to move towards is a, a best of, right? Because um, JSON schema isn't going to be able to pull everything for all the resources um, in the same way that you uh, functionally doing that statically would require me to discover every published resource and then throw together all of that in the options for uh, um, the published schemas, which isn't going to happen. Uh, so a VS Code extension is necessary to say, this stuff we can hand off to the extension, uh, to the YAML extension, this stuff we need to pull in uh, data ourselves to populate. Because um, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but right now that doesn't have hover. It's it's just filling out uh, IntelliSense. Um. Yes, yes, but I mean, like th there are APIs for for filling in hovering uh, hover helps as well. Uh, they are just not filled out yet. Yeah. Um, well, and and part of that problem, and this is one of the things that um, I'm hoping to see if we can address. It may not get addressed in release for V3, but um, maybe later is uh, including a docs model alongside the resource uh, definitions themselves, so that users and uh, integrating tools and extensions can actually surface documentation about resources where you're trying to use them. Because right now I, I know that that's a pain. The thing the DSC community has been trying to do for I don't know how many years, <laughs> that yeah. thing, Johan would be pleased to hear that because he's been the one driving the way. Um, yes, that's that's great. That would be great news. Yeah. Go, Mikey, go. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Th thank you, Andrew. That looks really good. Um, anyone has a question? It's just not... no. Have you been using it, Mikey, or not yet? Uh, I haven't been using it because I've been heads down in the um, the JSON schema definitions and then keeping up with the change log. Although, <laughs> if if we're lucky and I get my way, uh, a thing that might come out of this. Uh, work that would be um, two new modules in the documentarian namespace that Sean and I maintain, one for um, JSON schemas in general, and then the other for project change logs. Um, because keeping up with uh, changes across, I don't know, there's like a dozen different pieces of software in the DSC repository right now. Uh, and right now I've just been maintaining a single top level change log and pointing people at docs. Um, but I've been building some orthodoxy around a better way to do uh, change recording and surfacing of that documentation to users. Because I don't know about the rest of you, but I pretty much only read change logs under two conditions. The first is there's a new release. What cool stuff did you give me? And the second is there was a new release and my stuff's broken. How did you screw me up? Uh, what <laughs> did you do wrong? Um, That's what I do about every day. One one of those times I'm really excited, and the other time I'm really annoyed. Uh, and parsing through uh, GitHub release notes that are just PR titles drives me absolutely nuts. Better than nothing. Remember, Better than nothing. Better Captain Jet Sparrow, yes, Captain, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> you've heard of him, so yes, change logs yeah. are good. 
keep doing it. Not enough, yes. I would agree with that, but yeah, keep doing the change log. Yeah. The trick is to find something that won't make the engineers stab me to death, uh, but will um, give us a better way to uh, record changes. Because um, mm. I've been doing a lot of it post facto for each release. Like if you look in the repo right now, you'll see that there's a PR up for the preview eight um, or the preview nine uh, docs changes. Um, that includes just the change log. Uh, and I have to do the reference documentation and the rest of that as well, which is what I'm working on now. Although I got distracted because a bug I thought I fixed in my JSON schema generator broke again. But it worked on the last release. I remember fixing the bug, so I'm going to fight with it. That's fine. All right. Uh, Chris, you have a question, and there's no beginner question. There's just questions. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Chris. Uh, I've sort of been uh, getting involved in this stuff for a few years now. Um, work for a charity that does a lot of has a lot of Windows-based stuff still on-prem because we work in countries where where we have really bad cloud connectivity. So um, yeah, I'm trying to just bring some sanity to um, a lot of lots and lots of servers, Windows servers all around the place. <clears throat> so um just really so i've been developing in dsc 1.1 um probably since about two or three years ago i did at the time 2.0 was kind of i saw it on it was there it was available but it looked very beta and i was like okay let's stick with what i know to start with um so i've got quite a you know i'm using as was automation dsc the old the old thing in azure to roll stuff out the pool server and things like that um now i've watched um I've watched the DSC, is DSC Dead video. I've been watching that just to try and get my head around what's going on. So thanks for that. <laughs> uh, that was a good, that, just so I didn't ask a really stupid question. I was like, they, maybe they've already answered it. Um, I'm trying to just, could, could somebody just explain to me the the driving force as you see it behind the move from 1.1. And I'm seeing basically that basically we're going to skip to 3.0. That seems to be where, where the direction is going. Um, What's the, I think I know what the reasons are, but I'd like to hear it from the horse's mouth, the kind of the changes getting rid of the LCM. Just just explain to me what's going on, because I'm trying to kind of uh, get my head around that. Um, and sub supplementary question to that would be, what, what do you guys feel is really unique about DSC? What is it about DSC that, that, um, that makes it special as composed compared to other well, sort of, you know, I know. You, anyway, I think those two questions might be linked, but I'll let you talk and I'll I'll see if it's what I think it is. <laughs> this is a fun question. I yeah. like it, but it touches. It's a very big question. There's a lot of yeah. things to cover in that one. Yeah. Um, is anyone from Microsoft willing to start <laughs> part of the answer? I can talk about why I wanted a V3. <laughs> It, it's um, good because because it, let, let's just put the you know the the context there is you started doing config management much before you were doing DSC stuff, so I think that's good to remind people about this. Yeah, because yeah. I know your point of view because we discussed that at length for many years now. So yes, yes. Um, so for context setting, uh, once upon a time I did work in operations where I was responsible for configuring servers. Um, and what I had uh, settled on almost immediately before leaving my last operations role was that we were going to use Chef to configure our servers um, because we had a mixed fleet of Windows and Linux um, and Chef had a good enough integration with DSC that I could just use those resources and not have to worry about it. And if I needed anything custom, I knew I could write PowerShell classes and get it done. Um, but I went from there to Puppet where I worked on uh, initially their Windows team as a software developer. And then later on, after a bunch of reorgs, um, I worked on their DevX team after working on content that was essentially writing DSC resources for everything. Uh, and then on the DevX team, it was around both writing resources, but helping other people write resources and how you test configurations and all of the stuff around writing and deploying uh, configuration. So I lived and breathed that for more or less like six or seven years total. Um, and then I came here and uh, I started working on docs, which has been great. Um, and so one of the first things that I did uh, when I came through the door at both Microsoft and Puppet uh, is I was like, hey, here's my list of complaints now that you people are uh, stuck with me. Uh, here are the things that I want. And so for me, DSC, 
even in V11, the important thing to me was never the LCM. It was never the configuration language itself. The thing that I found really interesting and powerful about DSC was that uh, the resources were caller agnostic, right? You write a resource once, you call it with whatever tool chain you like to use. If you want to write your own Python that's going to shell out to PowerShell and call invoke DSC resource, you can do that. If you want to uh, do the awful work that I did of metaprogramming Ruby to write PowerShell to write Ruby to write Puppet to call PowerShell uh, so that people can use PowerShell DSC resources just as if they were any other Puppet resource, you can do that. I don't recommend it. I hated almost the entire set of that work. We, we can um, see the Scott issue. <laughs> Yeah, it's all over me. Uh, I'm mostly that scar tissue now. Um, but you could use it with anything. Uh, and I thought that was really powerful because the community of people who use IIS will always be larger than the community of people who are using IIS and Chef or IIS and, C and SQL or whatever, right? It doesn't matter what your higher order tool chain is. The users of the lower level application is always going to be a bigger pool. So we can save energy by figuring out how to represent that statefully once and doing it really, really well, which the DSC community has done a killer job of. Um, but for V3, one of the things that I heard all the time at Puppet when I was trying to get people to write resources in Ruby or write their resources in whatever they wanted uh, was, why can't I just do this in the thing I'm already comfortable with? Why do I have to fit your thing? Um, and it's like, well, that's how software works is the first answer. But the second and slightly more helpful answer is that we don't have a good model to, to enable that, right? And so when I started talking to the team, I said, and one of the pieces of feedback that I'm sure the team got all the time, I know because I used to get it when I was in operations, was like, I hear you that we should write DSC resources, but I'm not writing PowerShell. I'll write it in C Sharp, right? Or I'll write it in Rust or whatever you know language that that team happens to already be using. V3 allows you to do that. Um, the V3 contract is you adhere to this data model, you tell us what your properties are and how to call your thing, and that's it. That's all you have to do uh, other than implement the logic yourself, which you'll never escape. Um, but V3 also does a couple other things that uh, I desperately wanted from V1 and V2. The first is um, I wanted to know how my system was out of state, right? DSC V1, V2. If you run uh, start DSC config in test, what do you get? Right Or invoke DSC resource test, what do you get? This one's wrong. How is it wrong? I don't know. It's just wrong. So machine config's answer to that was to add the reasons uh, property where you could populate that. I frankly didn't love that because that conflates um, getting the current state with testing the current state, right? You can't separate those anymore. Right? Because the only time that you're going to get to populate uh, reasons, if you want it to be uh, useful across the board, is when you're retrieving uh, state. Um, and uh, it also means that we were always on the hook uh, for implementing this additional functionality, where theoretically, if your, if your resource can be uh, if your properties can be equivalency checked, right? You only have scalar values or you only have things that can be simple checked uh, case insensitively. Um, then the definition of the resource should be enough to be able to tell you uh, whether or not current state matches desired state. Um, there are cases where this isn't true. So like a good example of this is like, if I define, I want this package installed and I want the latest, the latest version and it comes back and it's 4.3, how do I know if that's latest? Right, that I, I specified latest. It said 4.3. Is that the latest? I don't know. Only the resource can tell you. You can't statically analyze that to determine whether or not it's it's in the state. So you need to be able to support both. But lots and lots of resources can be statically checked, desired state versus current state, and return whether or not they're in state. Um, I think the majority of resources, in my experience, are are that way. Um, so I want this to be able to get that. We have in the DSC resource that common, we have the uh, test DSC parameter state, which basically shows you that you probably could do that statically. Yep. Well, and, and that's another thing is that DSC v1 required the community to go and do a lot of building uh, and, and designing for stuff that should be handled by the engine, right? So for v3, you can write it in anything you want, whether that's PowerShell or otherwise. 
um, you can get some pretty good static analysis. You actually don't have to implement test in V3. If you really, really, if all you want to do is write a representation of current state, you can do that. Now you can't set the, the resource with that, but like the OS info um, resource, for example, <clears throat> the only code that it implements is retrieving the operating system information and returning that in the format that it's manifest specifies. It doesn't implement test. It doesn't have to tell you whether or not you def define the correct bit in this. DSC will, will check what you specified versus what it set back and tell you it itself, right? Um, let so, me, let me uh, add though, because the way you're saying this, people shouldn't understand that by what you're saying, it also means that the definition of resource is slightly different from what it was before. Yes. There's a slight difference in there and people need to realize that now because you can do this, which enables, I would say, okay, it enables uh, new, new opportunities. It's a slightly different concept than the resources that we used to know. Yes. Um, so what you should think of a V3 resource as a representation of state with one or more capabilities, right? Um, pretty much every resource is going to have the get capability. What is the current state of, of this resource? How much it supports beyond that capability is up to the resource author. So um, another thing that, that we couldn't get out of uh, V1, V2 was how is this going to change my system? I know it's going to but how? So V3 has uh, implemented what if support, which means that you can now call DSC config what if, uh, and it'll tell you not only which instances in your configuration document will trigger a change, but from what to what, right? Um, and if you don't implement what if yourself, DSC will give you a synthesized answer to that question, which is how test and get, um, uh, or how, how your desired state and current state differ. Um, now, it can't know any of the side effect things that that might imply, um, but it can give you a, a synthesis of it. Uh, and resource authors can implement their own um, specific uh, code path for what if, if they want to. Um, there's just, there's a lot of features and functionalities that I missed a lot when I was working uh, in DSC v1 that are resolved in v3. The other thing is the compilation step from uh, plain text to a moth, and then being able to deserialize that again, a nightmare for everybody, right? The amount of tools that are going to support MOF is approximately zero now. And I suspect that number is only getting lower as time goes on. I don't think it's ever going to get higher again. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, interdevelopment stuff uh, and a lot of opportunities for improved DevX and UX in, in V3 that I think are really important because the harder it is to author a resource, the fewer people will write resources. Um, and the harder it is for other tools to integrate with those resources, the fewer of them will bother to try. Um, so where V3 really shines in comparison to V1 and V2 is uh, a more flexibility in authoring, which I hope will be followed by an improved ease of authoring, um, and a much, much easier path for integration. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I was doing like four levels of metaprogramming to uh, get things to work between Puppet and DSC um, the way that I wanted. If I'd had what we have now, which are these JSON uh, documents that represent a resource, I wouldn't have had to do any of that work. I could have just written a single generic caller that handles the resource type, right? If you have a this resource manifest, then I do these things, and that would have been all the work I had to do. Um, there's a, a lot of opportunities in V3, and there's a lot of improvements. There's also um, a much better compatibility with ARM. Um, the, if you squint a little bit, the DSC V3 configuration documents look a little bit like ARM, uh, but they're in YAML because none of us wanted to write JSON all day. Although you can, it'll still work, but I just so, wouldn't. That was not a feature, by the way. Thanks for that. So, um, so that sort of helps me to understand and I think that was kind of what I was grasping. It was particularly trying to get away from the LCM model, trying to get into something that can be called. Well, I was looking at it going, it seems like you want to play, not, play nicer with Ansible and Chef and all those things, you know, that kind of stuff. That seemed to be one of the key benefits I could see out of it. I guess then that sort of feeds into the second part of the question is, um, 
I mean, I, I've not used Ansible, but I've looked into it enough to know that they do some Windows stuff. You know, what is it about what is it about DSC that is unique? Is it in my head? It's it's Windows. It's it's that it's that it does Windows better than anything else does because it's got the Microsoft backing. Or am I missing the point? Is there something else that you're trying to achieve that is like you know? Because or, or, I, I, in what way are you not reinventing the wheel is, is kind of the question I'm asking, I guess, if that's not insulting, let, well, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. l- let me just get into it, Mikey, first, because I have the the non-Microsoft answer from someone who's been in the, in the area for a while. And I just want to be, just, just to have some fun a little bit at Microsoft. Um, I would say that people realize that configuration management that was a problem in the 2006 timeframe and, and on and on and on. Uh, realized it's still a problem and it's still a challenge and we haven't solved any of those. And despite the existence of Ansible, Chef, Puppet and stuff like that, we still have the same problems. And we don't have less of those problems. We have more of those because we've got more systems to configure, different type of systems, because you can see um, a node, like an OS to manage, you know, that's one element to manage, but you've got, you know, SaaS services and you've got many other ways, many other things to manage. So it's not because we, if we're not doing anything, if Microsoft is not doing anything about it, you know, are they happy with everything which is provided in the community? And I would say Microsoft being Microsoft, one of the biggest software vendor and, you know, cloud provider and everything, are they happy with what exists and the risk of just letting it that way? Or do they see an opportunity to you know, innovate and then provide some answers to that? So I think there's this, which is like why Microsoft can see a value in developing into another DSC, which is not the same thing as, as the previous versions. Very, very different. I've very early on, I suggested you probably should not name this DSC, although the concept is still very much DSC. It's desired state configuration, but that's because Microsoft used that name at some point in time. Other companies used other names and it went to different solutions, Puppet, Chef, and later Ansible. And Ansible has a different uh, approach to it, I would say. But basically, that's it. That, like, is it still a problem? Yes. Is it still a problem to install software on uh, Windows machines? Yes. And there's still many solutions being built about this. And for the last 20 years, at least as far as I can remember, we've have, we've had the same problems. Configuration management, not solved yet. And then how to do it? We have got now a good idea with DevOps and principles and infrastructure as code. And we've evolved the thinking around it. But then we also need to expand a little bit with you know, a declarative state and then a deployment. And we have another thing which is called you know, Kubernetes, which is same thing, but like in a more integrated stack. So can we learn anything from there? And I would say like, there's those different elements that makes Microsoft think they can still do better and they would benefit do better so then their tools and anyone else can build, you know, better management and stack management with DSCV3. So that was my short, my short thinking about why, the why behind it. So, uh, I don't disagree with with any of that. Um, and one thing that I would say from my time and kind of like a uh, an optimistic hope, right? So um, one of the things that I found really compelling when I started using PowerShell uh, was uh, the idea of providers, right? That there was this uh, this idea of like uh, an underlying engine. Uh, and then I could shim whatever I wanted on top and I could use some familiar concepts uh, with it. And I could kind of uh, use these Lego bricks to build something that no vendor team was ever going to actually provide me, right? What V3 is trying to do in some ways is say, it's kind of crazy that we have 700 different ways to represent the data model of what the state of a component should be, right? Um, you know, these ones are written uh, in in uh, a Ruby dialect for Puppet. These ones are written in a Ruby dialect for Chef. These ones are in um, um, 
you know, uh, as a DSC class, or these ones are whatever I grew at home that I'm not sharing outside of here. So what DSC v3, an, am, an ambition uh, that maybe will never happen, maybe it would, I think it would be a cool world if it did, and it says, what if you were the author of software and uh, as the author of that software, you have to define how your software gets configured, right? This is the thing that every software author uh, with the configuration document or configuration API runs up against eventually. Um, the answer to most of those uh, that, that most vendor teams have given to this point has been, I don't know, somebody who cares about it in that ecosystem right away to do it, right? Um, and so uh, for SQL Server, for example, there's 70 something different ways for you to say what, how you want your SQL Server configuration to be set up. If you wanna script it by hand, you can do that. If you wanna use DBA tools, you can do that. If you wanna use puppets, resources, or chefs, resources, but none of that, none of that is shared across those implementations. The ambition here is what if the SQL Server team was able to write their own configuration commands and then just publish a manifest and anybody and everybody could use that for whatever their tooling is. They write the adaption uh, of that manifest to their use case or their tool chain, but the underlying, how do I identically configure this component of this software piece could be handled by that vendor, by, the, by those engineers that wrote that software. Because they're the people who are frankly best positioned to understand how to configure and test uh, the configuration for their, their software components, right? Um, we'll do a really good job. The DSC community has done a great job of building out test frameworks and designing resources to manage all sorts of components of software. Um, but uh, I think a better future, a possible future is one where if you're writing software that is configurable, you write code that sets your configuration and then you just tell everybody else how to call it. Um, and you can do that in whatever way makes sense to you, right? Because the, the flexibility of V3 says, I don't actually care what you're doing under the covers as long as you adhere to these API and data contracts. As long as we call, you know, whatever you said in your manifest and it gives back this data or um, it, it uh, performs this operation, then that's the way it works and everybody can rely on that. Um, so I think that's one of the ways where, where the promise of V3, the, the, uh, the hope of V3 is that we can get more first party configuration uh, definitions because the barrier to entry for those teams to this point has been, well, if you provide an Ansible module for managing your piece of software, the Puppet users will want one and the Chef users will want one and the PowerShell users will want one and everybody's gonna want one. So they don't do that because no PM wants to commit to supporting 11 different configuration management tools. The, the closest example of this that you'll see people get is Terraform. Most SaaS companies have you know, uh, figured out that they either need to do something for Terraform or ignore everybody. Um, they're not they're not writing these tools uh, for anybody else. Um, or people are writing adapters to take whatever they're already using and make it work for Terraform. Um, so I think, uh, and part of that is because you can use APIs, right? Um, and what DSD v3 proposes is essentially an API data model for a resource component. The implementation stuff is still up to you, but now there's a, a contractual way that you can do it separate from the implementation. Whereas in DSC v1 and v2, those two things were inextricably linked. How you defined a resource was a huge part of how you uh, your resource advertised itself. That separation uh, or that that linking is is no longer required. And theoretically, you could write a V3 adapter for um, Ansible modules so that you could uh, go from DSC uh, configuration document to calling Ansible, uh, uh, I think they're called modules, not resources, but the, the equivalent, right? Um, to set state. And that would be fine, right? You'd have to write the adapter, but you could do that. Um, and vice versa, Ansible, there's no reason Ansible can't call DSC v3 resources. Because the idea is to, to move to a, a higher order tool agnostic contract layer that says, this is what this is what my component does, and this is how to call it. And that contract is is 
powerful and being able to represent state and output uh, contractually is powerful. A lot of tools right now give you output that is just lines of text, right? For DSC, if you can get output from it, you can get it as JSON. And every language I've ever worked with for like the last 10 years has been able to parse JSON. And I can write a serializer in my language of choice to parse that JSON and then turn it into whatever objects I'm gonna use in, in my application code. So from an integration perspective, from a review perspective, from getting it to work with your web tooling perspective, V3 does a lot of things the other tools aren't doing yet or haven't done much of. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll think about it. I'll come back to you guys. And yes. More thoughts. <laughs> There's a lot of of the things in what Mikey said, which is like, ideally, we can get there, and then right. and then there's a lot of things there. And the problem is when you start a tool from the ground up, like you have to plan for those things, but at the same time, you can't say that you know there's still the spaghetti test. You don't know what's going to stick, yeah. you know, when it's cooked. So you've got to wait a little bit and then you know see how, see how it's used, and which is why it's in preview right now, and they're trying to go. Uh, finding a release candidate and then make sure people test it. So that's why you know they want to go that way. But I, I there's get, a lot get, of communication. Yeah. I guess where um where the question is coming from for me is um uh I mean I'm very much like a concrete guy. I'm just like how does it how does it affect me on the ground? Um I really respect the people that can do the blue and <laughs> the sort of blue sky thinking because it's not it's not where I'm at. And I think what I'm trying to do is understand well one of the things I'm trying to understand is when I need to migrate, which I'm sure I will probably need to at some point, um, what I'm going to get out of that for the, well, first of all, what that's going to involve, because uh, at the moment I've got, <clears throat> yeah, it's all in PowerShell, it's all just compiles a MOF file, dumps it up to the, <laughs> compiles it on the service, does all that. Now I've looked at it and I've gone, okay, that doesn't look impossible. I think I understand what's going on, but, you know, I've got some composite resources in there at the moment because that made sense for me. I don't think I can do that anymore. And I'm trying to sort of sit there and go, what's going to, where's the upside for me in sort of moving over? Um, like, what am I going to get out of this? Um, and that's kind of, you know, to achieve what I want to achieve. Um, that's that. That's where I'm trying to get my head around the changes, really. For this question, I would say, if you're in this position that where you just, like you, you're working in ops, I believe, and then you're just trying to manage ops, I would say you've got to wait for um, teams like the configuration team, which is behind machine configuration or whatever the name today, um, or to manage whatever. Uh, so yes, you've got to wait for these kind of teams to say, well, we, we will integrate with DSCV3 and this is the migration path or, or maybe you know the PowerShell team or the other team saying like we had whatever tool before and this is the direction how we we see you using it and then you've got to do a POC and then early enough to just say well you see Microsoft as you know Raymond did before and he said well how do we do with credential management, you know, mm -hmm. and this is like, yes, well, we have to do it differently because it wasn't good before, but that means like, are we solved the problem right now? Not yet. So that means everything else will need to wait. Yeah. Or, so, or it so, depends so, on what you're configuring. So at right now I'm probably doing the right thing by waiting, um, is what you're saying, I think. Kind of. <laughs> Yes, I yeah. would say, I would say, yes, don't try to, don't think that you have to, and that's that I think that's valid for everyone. Don't think yeah. that you have to to change everything you're doing right now to be able to comply with the DSCV3. Okay. Um, definitely look at DSCV3 to understand yeah. the differences in technology, but then you're still far from a solution. Yeah, with DSCV3. Well, that was the thing. I mean, even when I was looking at version two, I wasn't. I, I looked at it and I thought I can probably get this working. I can't remember what it was that I couldn't do, but there was something at the time that was in the docs and I was like, okay, that just, that's, that's the sort of thing that calls it off for me. But I wanted, you know, I'd never want to get stuck behind the technology curve and then, you know, you suddenly it's end of life and you're like, oh no, I've got to do all this at the least possible time. So I'm trying to kind of stay, stay in the know with it. But on the other hand, I'm looking at it at the moment going, oh, what, what actually do I get out of this? You know, and it is hard to look at it at the moment and go, 
when you get this i'm like well i've got that already you know <laughs> yeah so yeah I'm, you said you were running windows right yes yeah well, well because see for us the reason why i went with dsc i looked looked into going ansible that was my other sort of option and i figured out that pretty much everything i was going to do is going to be ansible calling dsc anyway um because i was going to end up using ansible dsc module and i thought well why bother you know i'll just and actually i'm really glad that i did because in terms of like troubleshooting modules and kind of getting you know doing just general testing it's a I'm, i don't know but i'm sure it's much easier that i'm actually like one step away um, i'm one step further closer to it and sometimes i see like issues coming up on pe where people are saying i'm using ansible and i'm having this problem and i'm sitting there thinking yeah it's probably a lot harder to work out what's going on because you haven't been you haven't had your hands dirty particularly in the old powershell stuff so um, i'm quite glad that i made that call um what what was interesting to me was that i was seeing I, I thought I definitely got that one of the things that was trying to happen was was you're trying to get it so that all of the other products can kind of interface with DSC in a kind of um, I'm not using the right words, but in, in, a, in a, the same way and that you're getting rid of the off stages. Therefore, all of that stuff was going to work a lot better. You could integrate with a whole load of tools instead of it being very 1.1 very much does feel like, yeah, you're going to learn PowerShell and you're going to use MOF files and you're going to do all these things. So I got that side of it. But again, for me, that's not really a selling point because I've got, I, I don't care. I'm in PowerShell world anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's helpful. I'm just trying to get my head around it, really. I, and then I said, like you said, what I'm saying is you should not change now. And, and the only thing I would say, like you should look into the DSC workshop because one of the reasons is the DSC workshop is, you know, how to manage a DSC configuration system and then infrastructure with DSC where the LCM on the DSC things is actually a tiny bit of the process and the principles. The principles are more important than what tooling you're using. And then it's much harder because everything's usually is hidden with the first, you know, the, the, the first tooling bits, which is like, how, but how do I do this tooling? I think what's important is to understand the concepts and how you should manage your configuration data, your release cycles, your your collaboration between your team on getting through. And then when you have a tool like DSC, which we say, okay, where does that fit into my company, into my processes, into my stuff? And then you say, well, it, I'm missing this bit and this bit. And then you start asking the questions around, see what people have built and maybe how you can integrate that. That's helpful. Thank know. you. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah. good. I think it's it's something I'm definitely learning. And um it started out with the question of I want to roll out an active directory with a whole load of AUs and permission entries because we have lots and lots of like I have people in I need to give like somebody this access to this OU and they've got 20 places. And I'm like, I don't want to script that. And then you look at this and go, oh, that made it easy. And then you start to go, oh, what else can I use it for? And <laughs> and yeah, it's uh, And you're yeah. hooked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a, there's a very good point from Andrew, if you can read it while I'm just checking something, Andrew, you asked Chris to. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, basically, um, um, I just want to suggest, uh, so the, the V3, DSCV3 is currently in, well, in, in a relatively early stage, right? So it's actually a very good, it's a perfect time for submitting feature requests or or any feedback at all actually um so uh just feel free to open an issue uh in that repo that i posted and say uh hey guys i i would like dscv3 to have this and this and functionality or having an integration with this or this tool or technology and uh it's uh it will be triaged and most likely accepted or at least work some plan uh, the, the work on this will be, uh, you know, budgeted with the, uh, uh, and planned um, because V3 is currently in pre-release stage. It, again, it, it's very easy to um, add new features or um, integrations with other tools at this point. So it's the perfect time to submit feature requests using uh, that repo that I posted. Please, please do and please provide feedback. Thanks. And, and you can just add the question you just asked, because it's not because we gave you the answers we believe are correct, that it will have the same effect as you posting this question and then many having many people looking at this question and say, well, what does it mean by this? And maybe starting the conversation like that. 
All right, uh, we we 20 minutes over, which is a good thing because we had a good chat. Uh, do you have anything else? Otherwise, I believe maybe we should just stop the recording for now. And then for whoever wants to stay a bit longer, they can ask whatever uh, last questions they want. And then Daniel is going to put the recording at some point. Sorry, I'm telling. Yep.